Great. Yeah. Alrighty, take it away, Beth. Well, everybody, um, I'm so delighted on behalf of Lifelong to reintroduce Professor Carl Chrisman from Valencia College. He um, gave us a history of the Constitution last year, and we're going to go into the evolution of the Bill of Rights tonight. But first, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Carl, because the work that he does is so gracious. He has um, been a professor at Valencia for 20 years. He's chairman of their history discipline department but since 2009, but he founded a program called Valencia at Westminster, where he presents, and he and other friends present academic programs to the people at the Westminster uh, Senior Living Center in Winter Park. And I just think that's such a generous use of time. I want to salute you, Carl, for that, and that you coordinate history-based teaching at mm -hmm the public library in Winter Park. Again, it's building community and educating community all at the same time, things that are very dear to my heart. So we have never met in person, but I feel like we're we're like soul, soul siblings. And um, with that, I wanna say, take it away. And I'm really gonna enjoy this evening. Uh, thank you so much, Beth, Janet, and everyone at Lifelong. Um, it's a pleasure, I'm glad to be back. Um, I don't know if it's raining down there, but it's raining up here in Winter Park again. We've got a wet August. Um, interesting. So if it gets a little noisy, sometimes the rain can be kind of strong, as you know. But we're going to dive right in. I want to encourage you, as I do my students, um, to be willing to ask any questions. Now, of course, Zoom makes it a little more difficult. So what I encourage you to do is to jot down a question that you might have. Hopefully I'll be at the end and we'll have time. And I've got pretty much as much time as you're willing to stick around with me if, if you are willing to ask or interested in asking more questions. So the Bill of Rights obviously is, a, as you know, the, the first 10 amendments that we added to the Constitution. And as Beth was saying last year, we talked about the Constitution. Obviously, this talk that you give in September is connected to um, the celebration of the Constitution. And so we'll kind of just dive right in to what we ended with last time. The fact that in 1788, we had our first election, 1789, George Washington is selected by the Electoral College to be the first president. He was a president of a nation with 11 states. I made this real emphasis with you last time because both North Carolina and Rhode Island had rejected the constitution. And it wasn't really clear what was gonna happen with them. A large portion of their rejection, as well as you can see on the map, deep opposition, in South Carolina, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New York, Virginia, um, all these places was mostly because of concern of what the Constitution meant in a variety of arenas, but specifically that it didn't come with any sort of a listing of rights. So this was kind of a surprise to most people who we're going to kind of dig into. So what I wanted to do tonight was to start with looking at, well, why did they think there needed to be a listing of rights? And to do that, we need to back up. And that goes back into the questions that we find ourselves back before the country was even a country, even before the American Revolution. I mean, the American Revolution can be understood as what I call the fourth English Civil War. So it's the fourth major time that they had fought against each other. And they fought against each other over the question of the rights of individuals. Now, the British concern for rights goes way back, as you know, to the Magna Carta. Um, they were the first um, society, certainly after the Renaissance, um, but coming out of the Middle Ages to begin raising this question of what are, are the expectations, you might even say, for an individual in a civic entity. Because as you may remember, I said this last time, but um, when you look at the history of the species, the historic norm for governance is what I call the power pyramid in which there is a single or very small number of people at the top. And then the bulk of the people have no agency, no contribution, nobody expects them to contribute. And except for Rome and for Athens, and then later a few Italian city-states, a couple of places, perhaps in the Swiss Alps, most places stuck with that common pattern for the human species on all different you know, continents. And so the British were one of the first to kind of say, maybe this should look differently. And this really comes to a head out of the Renaissance. And so in England, as they approached the years after Queen Elizabeth, as they moved into the 1600s, 
But it, during the time of Elizabeth, so in the end of the 1500s, as the Renaissance is really kind of ebbing out into, well, we're not on the Enlightenment yet, but in those years, England was confronting two questions that would emerge from this idea of the Renaissance. Because the, the Renaissance basically, in simplified terms, is saying that the individual has merit, the individual has worth, the individual can think, the individual has uh, purpose, can have agency. And thus, thinkers and philosophers begin to contemplate, well, if that's true, then shouldn't the individual in a certain location have agency within the civic government? So that had not been worked out very much. And the British are going to argue this through the 1600s. So as you know, of course, our colonization of the English colonies on the East Coast are in this time window of the 1600s. So for the colonists that are the British citizens in North America, this idea of having some specific rights was something that was common to their thinking. They all basically had this idea and they had lived through, and obviously most were still in England, those who come over, say if we get to 1700, most of the Americans, the British citizens in North America are those who have come over from England. They're coming over in this contentious century in which the questions being asked are who should govern? Is it the monarch, the old system, the, the, the power pyramid, or do the people have a voice? And if they do, in what way? And what's the religion? How uh, do we understand the religion in that me? process? Me, it's me. It's my way, Somebody's <laughs> microphone's on, so I want to turn that off and mute, make sure everybody's <laughs> muted. Uh, so you, you want to make sure that you um, are look. they're looking for how do we understand our individual connections, if we have them, like with a spiritual figure. So this is not answered by the early Stuart Kings, James and Charles, and in that first 40 years leading into the, the Civil War, the official English Civil War, those questions will be unanswered. So that, of course, then leads to conflict. Both James and Charles will rule for various times without calling Parliament. This is very important because it's at this moment that Parliament, and in particular the House of Commons, which the House of Commons, as you probably know, is the place for the peasant, for the non-aristocrat. And so... The House of Commons in particular beginning to argue that their role was should not be advisory, but be kind of directive for the country. Now, again, the idea of parliament goes back to Magna Carta, but from that time all the way through, and if you look at other places besides England, where there might have been a gathering of the nobility to speak to the king or whoever was the leader, it was only advisory. It was really if the king asked. So when James and Charles ruled without having parliament in session, they felt like that was quite normal. But in England, they were saying, I don't think that should be normal. This ultimately leads to the Civil War. Parliament wins, but they don't really have a plan for what to do next. And so those years eventually are known as the Commonwealth. Um, Oliver Cromwell and the military will take over, and there's actually a way to even look at that as a pseudo-military dictatorship. But long story short is it doesn't work out so that the people in England, the parliamentary leaders, want to restore the monarchy. So, but again, when they restore the monarchy, they're still questioning who should be in charge, who ultimately is in charge. They thought they might have gotten this solved when they restored the sons of the deceased king, also named Charles and James, um, but it didn't work out that well. And so that by the time when Charles dies in 1685, he dies unexpectedly. When he dies, these problems have not been solved. Well, from the restoration to this point, you have the beginning of political parties in England, largely surrounding the idea of, do you support the king and to some degree, the king's right to rule or do you not? So the Whigs would be on the side of saying, no, we really want Parliament to be in charge and the king should be subordinate to Parliament, while the Tories were on the side of saying, we support the monarch. Embedded in that question was a question of, again, the religion, which had seemingly been, been solved under Elizabeth's time. But in the years that they were in France, Charles's brother James had become more enamored with the Catholic faith. And when his wife had died, who had been a Protestant, he married a Catholic woman, and so they were determined to raise any future children as Catholics. Well, 
James is just the, as they say today, the spare monarch. He's not really, it doesn't really matter. But when Charles died, all of a sudden it mattered. It became an issue. Then three years later, he has a son. And when he has a son, this is what kicks off the decision of the Whig party in particular to rebel and lead to yet another civil war that becomes known as the Glorious Revolution in later history, obviously Whig historians writing the Glorious Revolution. It was also called sometimes the Bloodless Revolution because James, instead of fighting like his father had done, just fled the country. There's a lot of questions about what he was actually thinking. Now, this all leads us up to this critical moment for why we're going to our Bill of Rights. In case you're wondering, why, why are we looking at this? Because when the Whig Party reached out to James's daughter, Mary, of the first marriage, and her husband, William, in the Netherlands, so William of Orange, they did so with a list of rules. Now, this is really a key moment, really, in, in global history, because you have to imagine you're, it'd be as if you were being asked to be in charge of a CEO of a company and maybe a company that had always had power, but then you were being asked to do so without actually having the ability to express that power, that there was going to be another group that was going to kind of dictate what the company did. If you had grown up or only knew of these companies having this power, you might imagine that such a person would say, no, I don't want to do that. Now, there's questions for why William wanted to do it, and it's connected to his wars with Louis XIV of France. But regardless, for that reason, he is re, um, given this declaration of right when he comes by the political leaders. Now, they'd already given it to him ahead of time, but officially he's given it to him. Then, as you can see, through the year of 1689, it's kind of works its way through, through the parliament. It's interesting, in April, after it's already been established, they're going to make it, that William and Mary and their co-monarch, so Mary was um, the, the next queen of England, they agree to govern according to the statutes in Parliament. Normally, it had been the laws and customs granted by the kings of England. So you can see here already that Parliament is establishing itself as the kind of controller of power and the um, agency actor. In other words, things that will be done at least in their minds, those writing in 1689, will be done with Parliament. Eventually, it's passed in Parliament, and William and Mary will give their assent. Now, this is the document that then becomes the foundation for what the British colonists living in North America believed they were rebelling for in 1776 and believed that was missing in the document in 1788-89. So what are these? You may have seen these before. When you read over these, I'm not going to read them all to you, but I want you to look and see, do you see things that are familiar? So there that right off the bat, who's executing the laws? Well, Parliament is. The monarch can't interfere with our elections. The monarch can't interfere with the ability to have speech, either for elected officials or even for common people. And again, keep in mind, this is a time period in which if you were a common person, you would have never dreamed that you should have had equal capacity to speak. Beth and I were just talking. If you heard about President Biden having gone to visit the auto workers who are on strike, can you imagine being there and feeling like, oh, he's the president. I can't talk to him. Now, we should hopefully always honor the office, but we would say President Biden, like all the previous presidents, is just a human, and I could talk to him like anybody else. But in the 1600s, that would not have been the case. And so here they're saying, hey, it's the right of the individual human to be able to speak directly to the monarch. And the fact that he is the monarch does not separate him or her from me. You'll see issues about the military, questions about whether that can be a standing army. And very important to, to our founders, questions about the judicial issues. So all of these things are affirmed in both the first Declaration of Rights and then what is actually passed in Parliament as the Bill of Rights. These become crucial to understanding even why there's a revolution. If you want to do a deep dive on the revolution, if you go and read things like the our Declaration of Rights from the Stamp Act in 1765, or if you go and look and see um, what we said to out of the first Continental Congress when we wrote the Declaration of Resolves, you'll have this reflection of the English Bill of Rights. Our understanding or our 
tension relative to what we felt King George III was doing, quote unquote, to us was out of our sense of what had been promised to us as citizens of Britain. Final slide here on this, that we can see that Parliament then is going to assert dominance in key issues. It is going to answer the question of religion by passing an act of toleration. It's going to answer a question of who's in charge by passing the Triennial Act. And so it's very clear from this point, it doesn't matter whether the king wants there to be a parliament, the parliament is meeting on its own. And in fact, they go on, as you can see with the act of succession, and say, we will actually be the ones who determine who the monarch is. If the current parliament, this is my understanding, the current parliament somehow did not want King Charles III to have been the monarch, they would have had the right to step in and intercede in some way. So that's a that's a departure from what we all know when we think of monarchs and bloodline secession. Parliament's saying, hey, we common people are going to decide who's in charge for us at the executive branch. So that's a very powerful move on their part. And this will dominate the thinking, as I was saying, for the people in North America and the many hundreds of thousands who will come over in the years between, say, 1689 and 1776. So this is the mindset that is in the mix when they're creating the Constitution. They're thinking in terms of how do we construct a government that gives agency for the individuals. And this is James Madison's big moment. We, we talked about this a year ago. I'm sure you know these things. So, so James Madison successfully navigates the writing of a new government. As I hope you remember, there had been a previous government. The fact that it, there was a previous government, which in the minds of its supporter was not bad, was not incorrect, and should not have been changed, which is that first map that I showed you that we talked in depth a year ago. That talk's available, I think, on your all's website. Certainly, it's available on my YouTube channel if you want to try and, and I can show you how to find that. But the point being that when we get to the struggle over rights, the challenge that's coming from are from the supporters of the first government who are saying, hey, we like this government, mostly because the Articles Confederation was a better reflection of John Locke's thinking. And this seemed like, and I would say it was, a clear move to Hobbes. When it's written, neither John Adams nor Thomas Jefferson are in the country. Thomas Jefferson, by this point, had kind of reached almost mythical status as kind of our great philosopher. And there was no one that was higher respected in the ideas of designing government than John Adams. So both were missing. It'd have been interesting had they been in Philadelphia, how things would have gone differently. I mean, the, the, the constitutional moment is sort of James Madison's coming out party and everybody recognized that he was e easily the equal of John Adams and current historians will often say he was perhaps stronger than John Adams in constitutional thinking. I, I don't agree with that based on Adams's background, but that's a different question. While he was in England, because at this point, Adams is our diplomat to England um, post-war, Jefferson is our diplomat to France post-war. There, there are main two Americans who are in Europe. Adams had consistently been having a kind of a running debate with Europeans as to what we were trying to do. So he finally decided he would write a book to answer this question. It happened to be written, and he was in the kind of the final third when the Constitutional Convention happened. But when he wrote a defense of the Constitution and the full title you can see there in the picture of the government of the United States of America, he's not writing about the Constitution Madison is talking about. He's writing about the constitutions of the 13 individual states, as well as the articles. But he's really talking philosophically about, well, what were we trying to do? I hasten to remind you that when we rebelled, we were rebelling against the most liberal government in the world. And as we just talked about, a government that was structured in a way to provide rights for citizens that nobody else on the planet was doing. So not surprisingly, particularly in England, people were like, why did you do that? Like, what are you saying is wrong with our system? So he writes a book to talk about it. So when he and Jefferson got their copies, they wrote to each other. They were in constant communication while they were in Europe for various reasons, mostly because they were friends. And so Adams 
writes and is generally positive in what he writes to Jefferson, but he noted that a declaration was needed. In fact, he says, should not such a thing preceded the model? And this is an interesting thing, which we may come back to here in a little later when we look at our quote unquote Bill of Rights, but I'll just give you the, the, um, the foreshadowing now. We technically don't have a Bill of Rights. We technically have 10, really eight amendments that talk about rights. The idea of a Bill of Rights was something, and what Adams is referencing to is what he did in Massachusetts and what many of the states did, which was a listing of rights that preceded any written information about how the government should be structured. So what Adams is noting, he's like, where are the rights? The rights should have been page one before you ever got to we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. Before you ever got to that part, there should have been a listing of rights that was separate from the government, but first in your reading, and there's not one. So he's concerned about that. Jefferson echoes his concern. In fact, Jefferson was Madison's hero, and so they were in constant communication. So Jefferson writes to Madison, he says, look, there's some things I like, but let me tell you what I don't like. First, the admission of a Bill of Rights. He's also shocked that there's an executive. Now here, he and Adams have different views. Adams liked that there was an executive in his book, Defense of, of, of Governance, and in his own Massachusetts Constitution, in his earlier writings, Adams had always said there should be multiple branches with separate and kind of isolated power, and one of those should be an executive. And as he said to Jefferson, as you can see there, he said, you're afraid of the one, because Jefferson is at this moment in Paris when they're having the French Revolution. So he's already kind of in this mindset of the world would be a better place if you didn't have any sort of monarch or, again, that power pyramid system. So John notes this, and he's like, well, you're afraid of the individual. I'm afraid of the few. And then he says it more boldly in a few more phrases. You are apprehensive of monarchy, I of aristocracy. And the idea of aristocracy is not germane to our topic tonight, but when you study John Adams, you find this is a key thing for him to suggest that in every society of every group of people, there will always be an elite wealthy class. You can never get away from that. And so then you need to structure your government in a way that respects that, knows that, and to some degree curtails that. And for Adams, the executive branch, one of the roles for Adam was the executive branch would curtail the power of this kind of elite powerful few. And clearly in our government, that has not been the case, but that's a different conversation. Now, Madison was really taken aback and both in private letters to other people and in his letter back to Jefferson, he's, he's hurt. Again, Jefferson's his hero. So imagine you writing one of your heroes or your mentors and, or having your mentor write you saying, well, I'm a little disappointed in a few decisions you've made. Right. I've got some mentors who I've sent some things to often. I, I'm always waited with bated breath. Like, are they going to like it? Are they going to agree with it? And if they don't, I'm really sad. Right. I don't I don't like that. And again, I stress one of the differences. It's also where Adams and Jefferson kind of break part, break ranks is that Jefferson's mind was never concerned with the structural issues of a governance. And he would never would have been in a political science class. He was not a good politician in the sense of understanding how politics works. He was a good politician in other arenas, Jefferson. And so because he's at the moment where the French Revolution is happening, he, he's really wrapped up in this sort of the birth of liberty and how we get there is fine. I mean, he would have dismissed and played off the fact that there was a guillotine with heads being chopped off. Adams tries to warn him of this. And Jefferson's like, ah, it's no big deal. Um, in fact, he even says, you know, the, it's better with the tree of liberty is kind of get some manure from fresh blood. And, you know, there's a part where I'm kind of like, I don't think that's the way you should have said it, Jefferson. But in any case, what Madison, if, if Adams is afraid of the aristocracy and Jefferson's afraid of the monarch as reflected in a stronger government, so a Hobbesian government, Madison's afraid of the mass. He's afraid of the people. And part of this comes from he had been a congressman in the Articles Confederation. And in his opinion, it had not worked well because it was so decentralized and, quote unquote, weak in governing power to the point that the people, Madison thought, had more power. 
Now, this could get us into a dovetail about the question of democracy. I'll just remind everybody that we form a republic. We form a republic with the Articles of Confederation. We reassert that it's a republic in the Constitution. And to date, we haven't changed our government. So we're not a democracy, which is a completely separate and different type of government. And Madison clearly at this point is saying, I don't want to do that because in the hands of the majority is danger, in Madison's opinion. Thomas Jefferson would have been willing to roll the dice for that. He and Franklin were probably the two who would have been most likely to be open for a possible democracy. But obviously Franklin was in Philadelphia and though he prodded a few places for a more democratic system, he backed away because he was satisfied that there was the one nod to democracy in the House of Representatives. Okay, ultimately both Adams and Jefferson will come out openly and say, I'm in support, they send letters to that, that effect saying, I'm in support and we're ready for it to go. Um, and I hope it gets adopted. So we're good. And it's nice that he gets those letters. However, it's not going to be enough initially, because as we talked about, there's a strong opposition in nearly every state. There are many people who are unhappy. And in fact, you could arguably say that Madison and the guys in Philadelphia cheated because according to the Articles of Confederation, an adoption of, a, of any amendments needed to be unanimous, which was probably an unwise plan, but nonetheless, that was the plan, that it would be unanimous. And the model from the Declaration was that it should be unanimous. But Madison already realizes, we're probably not gonna get there. He knew that Rhode Island had not even come to the convention, and he knew that most of the leaders in North Carolina had left the convention, and there were some other key people who stayed at the convention, but refused to sign it, and, and most perhaps impressively, or foreshadowing the governor of Virginia, who was at there, said, I'm not signing this thing. And so Madison knew. So they said, we'll go with nine, nine of 13. If we get the nine of 13, we'll be good. So the convention will send the proposed government to the states. They were told to call for some sort of elections in their state to choose a state convention about ratifying. Notice this bypasses the state legislatures, which was a key goal of Madison to try to weaken some of the power in the states, and in particular in the state legislatures. Delaware, New Jersey, Georgia, right out the bat, they, they vote unanimously amongst their elected. There were anti-federalists in these states, but very small numbers. Pennsylvania, Connecticut go next. And theirs is basically two to one, almost three to one in Connecticut's case. Then in February, you can see it's going to be tight. Massachusetts has a very close vote. Um, I think Adams' letters back played a role, but the state's basically evenly divided over this. Meanwhile, at the same time, New Hampshire had tried to call for a convention in February, and it was very clear. It was probably two to one anti-federalist. And so the federalists in the room are able to table the motion and say, we'll come back later. Um, Virginians, who were probably... 60, 40 anti-federalists decide we're not going to have this conversation because what they were hoping was more states would vote no. North Carolina doesn't even have a vote because they too can see, hey, this isn't going to go well. New York, like Virginia, also pauses. So even though you've had five vote yes, you've had one clearly vote no and three others that are leaning no. So five to four, not, not, a, not a good start. So this, of course, is when Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay begin the process of saying, we need to really communicate well as to what we're doing. Now, again, we still haven't got to the rights part yet, but again, understand this battle that we, and we talked about some of this last time, this battle over electing. Again, what I'd like to tell some people is that, you know, the sixth grade version is that we were all minding our own business in 1760, 1770, and then England came and bothered us. We defended ourselves and our rights with a war gloriously led by George Washington, and then we wrote a government, and everybody went home happy. And the opposite of that is basically true. And so here at the Constitution, we can see that there's a big debate, and behind the debate is questions about the power of government. Again, we covered that last time. It's a question of Locke and Hobbes. But remember, embedded in Locke, almost kind of at the core of Locke's ideas, is that the individual person, in this case, individual citizen, has a promise of life, liberty, and property because they're alive. And the government that's constructed is not giving us rights, but is protecting the rights we naturally have. So here in this government, all of a sudden people are saying, where are those rights protected? They're not stated. 
So Madison, Hamilton, and Jay are wanting to explain what they did, why it's there, why is there an executive, why does it have the ability to tax, all these other things. But increasingly, the question of rights keeps coming up. And they were opposed by the rock stars. I mean, you can't get a better list than Patrick Henry, Sam Adams, Thomas Paine, who didn't put on there, George Clinton, the governor of Virginia, Mercy Otis Warren. The Otis family was one of the most powerful families in the early days of the revolution in Massachusetts. And Mercy was somebody who was adamantly in support of the articles in their version of expressing a Lockean government. And they tried quickly to say what went on in Philadelphia was treasonous. Madison dodges that because of the appearance and the presence of George Washington. Nobody wanted to call George Washington a traitor. So, so that kind of protected it. But you can see what they're saying. You guys are trying to, quoting Mercy Owens here, an annihilation of the independence. Wow, that's big stuff right there. They were really saying that liberty that we had worked for and fought for was being overthrown. They were saying an executive seems to be exactly like a monarch. They were saying the government we have is fine. Madison's wrong. Just give it time. They were saying this idea of a republic is naturally must be small. Any attempt to do it at a large level will fall apart or give way to tyranny at some point. You'll end up needing Hobbes, Leviathan, if you have a large republic. This is why it's really important to remember for us in America, we hear the word state and we think of distinct part of a whole. We think of it as a discrete thing, as only a part though of a whole. But we need to remind ourselves historically, the word state basically could be a synonym for nation. And when you think of all these words of civic entity, an empire, a kingdom, a tribe, a state, a city state, a nation, though they mean different things and they're used in different times and place in our global history, they really are the same thing. So the 13 states, we'd be better off talking about them as the 13 nations that had formed this confederation of a unity, but the unity was a loose association of friendship. And so when they're talking about the size of the republic needing to be small, they're thinking, in order to protect the rights we believe we have, my first nation is Virginia. My first nation is Pennsylvania. My first nation is Massachusetts. Then I will give adherence to a larger entity. Well, Madison had changed all that, and they're like, I don't think this is a way for liberty. Uh, Mercy talks at length about this, her fear of aristocratic tyranny. She says it will eventually terminate in the most uncontrolled despotism. There's no limit to the judiciary powers. There's nothing that says we're going to have jury trials. And remember, the idea of a trial by jury of my peers is an enshrinement of kind of the re Renaissance concept that every individual has merit. It, it always breaks my heart a little bit when I when I hear of people, friends of mine, who get a, a jury summons, and you probably have friends like this too, and how many of them most often will complain or try to get out of it? They'll talk about they don't want to get it. It's a, it's a, it's a tragedy um, of, of high proportion, but it also speaks to the, the loss or the lack of understanding of both citizenship and what it means to participate in a citizenship in which you as the individual have a right or an, an opportunity to speak for and to your neighbor in aspects of their lives, meaning governance and decision about law doesn't belong at some other higher power in which you can't speak to that. So as you can see, Madison thought that this plan, I mean, sorry, Warren thought this plan ultimately was to destroy, and again, state governments, think of that as national governments or the governments of Virginia, and what? Offer a consolidated system. Well, Madison probably would have said yes to the second part. He would have said, no, I'm not trying to destroy any state governments. But yes, I want a consolidated system. We talked about why in that. But again, behind all this is this growing sense of question of doesn't there need to be some rights? Now, this gets us into kind of a structural question about the Constitution, because Madison's answer would be no. I mean, it clearly was no, because he wasn't unaware of rights listed in either the English Bill of Rights or in other states having some listings of rights. What Madison thought, and you can see he says there, I never viewed it in an important light. I never thought it was important. 
What Madison's arguing for here is an idea that the government could only do what was enumerated in the document. Now, Hamilton agrees with him. Hamilton also did not think there needed to be an additional Bill of Rights. He didn't see in any way that the Constitution should be read as a limit on people. It just merely listed the powers of government and what it listed it could do. It could do. It wasn't listed. It couldn't do those things. There's also, to be fair, an argument that when a conversation about rights came up in Philadelphia, it was towards the end of their six months, and there were some who thought we should deal with this later. So maybe had it come up earlier, but again, Madison was not going to bring it up. When he brings forward his plan, his Virginia plan, there's no listing of rights because, again, in his mind, this is something that is going to be protected because of what the government is not allowed to do. This is what we eventually will know as strict construction, that the government can only do what the Constitution specifically states. When we do have the quote unquote Bill of Rights, those first 10 amendments, as we'll look at here in a minute, the 10th amendment is kind of the bulwark on this point, saying that the government, if, it, if it's not listed, then it lay with the states. Now that becomes a contentious issue, which we will again, we'll talk about in a little bit. Once Washington comes into power, and it's not Washington, so once we start the new system, and perhaps Hamilton is the most egregious about this, it's fair that the anti-federalists were probably right, meaning that even though Madison could think that it should have been strict construction and only doing enumerated rights, other people could read in the vagaries of the document, which is one of the things that Mercy Owens warns is pointing to, as is Patrick Henry and some others, it's not very clear so some people like Hamilton could to some degree say, well, actually, we can do whatever we want unless it's strictly prohibited. This becomes known eventually as loose construction. And you see this in Article 1, Section 8, the very famous necessary and proper clause. So as I tell my students to just pick something out of thin air, you know, can the government make us wear, wear masks during a time of medical crisis? Madison would say no, because it's not listed. Hamilton would say yes, because maybe it's necessary and proper for the good will of the country. So even though it's not listed, they should be allowed to do that. That's not our debate today, but that's why he's not going to have a list of rights, Madison. Okay, so the debate then kind of takes and builds momentum as we're going forward. Maryland and South Carolina vote yes. So now you're kind of at an eight to one vote and you only need nine, so you need one more. But it, all the ones that are left are largely against. So can you get to nine becomes the question. In the moments that are happening leading up to that moment, you already had states saying we're ratifying it, but we demand amendments. And the amendments are stacking up. Now, now those 124 different amendments, I think it's I should have written that differently. Some of the states sent in identical concepts. Um, so it wasn't 124 um, unique ideas. But there were, again, 124 different suggestions being sent in, which is going to be really a challenge for guys like Madison to try to figure out, because you know we're going to go to putting the 10 amendments in. Now, so let's get narrowed down to the final 10. So in New Hampshire, as already said, initially in February, they gathered to have their vote. It's clear the vote is going to be anti-federalist. So the Federalists will table the motion. Now, between February and June, the Federalist papers and other local writers are really winning the opinion. And this is one of the things when you look at there, you can buy a book today that are the anti-Federalist papers, but that's a historian who's put them together. One of the problems for the opponents of the Constitution is one, they got labeled, don't ever get in a group that's labeled anti-something, you'll never win the hearts and minds of people but they had never really coordinated their efforts. Hamilton and Madison in particular had very coordinated efforts as kind of who's writing what, with Hamilton writing most of them, but nonetheless, there's some real coordination in who's writing, and they were in constant communication, Hamilton and Madison, which again is interesting because you know eventually they'll become deep enemies by the time we get to the 1790s. But at this moment, they're close colleagues and they're writing each other. And in fact, in both states, in North Carolina, I'm sorry, in Virginia and New York, there's a sense in which Hamilton and, and Madison are both stalling slightly 
So they're hoping the other one can solve the, the conundrum and, and get their vote, their state to vote forward. In any case, in New Hampshire, New Hampshire will become the ninth. Again, perhaps to some degree they cheated because when they gathered, it was clear to the Federalists that everybody who had been elected wasn't present yet. And many of those missing were anti-Federalists. So they pushed for a vote. The anti-Federalists tried to stop the vote. They couldn't stop the vote. So there was a final vote, as you can see, 57-47. There was some who were on the fence who finally were convinced by we'll be the ninth state, we'll be the hero state. So what's happening in Virginia? Again, you have Patrick Henry and George Mason. They're out in front saying, we are never going to do this. And so they stalled their meeting because they had hoped there'd been there'd be a movement against. And again, initially five to four, so maybe, but none of those four ever came through with the voting other than Rhode Island. And that was really in a straw poll, as I'll show you later. And so now Henry realizing, well, we're kind of just gonna have to do it ourselves. And maybe if we vote no, that will stop the whole thing. They don't know about New Hampshire's vote. And again, they're kind of assuming New Hampshire is going to vote no. So they're pressing to go. Interestingly, Edmund Randolph, who I told you is the governor of Virginia, had been in Philadelphia, had opposed what he saw, what was there, he didn't like it, and refused to sign. Most people who came to Philadelphia, like many of the North Carolina um, delegates, when they saw what was happening, they just left, which, by the way, that's a bad plan. Even if you're in the minority position, if you leave the room or the conversations happening, you no longer have the ability to have any influence whatsoever in what comes out. But they left Randolph to his credit, did not. He stayed, was a critic all the way through, um, but he still was there. And so he didn't sign. But now in Virginia, he begins to make speeches early to say, hang on a second, I didn't sign it. I probably still wouldn't sign it. But now we're talking about what's Virginia's role in the country. And if you know anybody from Virginia, they're usually they'll tell you how proud they are of being the first colony and they're the first in everything. And most Virginians, particularly in this time period, all the way up to the Civil War, certainly believe the United States should just be called the United States of Virginia. They saw the nation as an extension of themselves. So Randolph, who opposes the writing and the structure of the government, is thinking, wait a minute, I don't want to be outside of the country we founded. And so there begins to be this movement. And by by June, he is clearly on the Federalist side, which is a problem for Patrick Henry. Interestingly, and this kind of gets us what we'll get to in a minute, James Monroe comes out as an anti-Federalist. Now, James Monroe and James Madison were casual friends. They had served in various capacities. They were close in age. So they're the younger generation of the revolutionary group. Um, but Monroe had become in agreement with Henry in the sense of the things he didn't like. There's no rights. The executive is in control of the military. So as Jefferson had written, well, that means that the executive could stay in power forever if he wanted to. He controls the military. Um, what if he's being impeached? Well, he controls the military. He could fight back. Um, so that was a concern that they had. Monroe was very opposed to the idea of direct taxation. And so eventually he is a is a, one of the loudest members of Virginia's ratification convention opposing it. However, with the effort of Madison, with the effort of the governor and other key federalists, um, momentum goes their way. Henry's last effort to get Virginia to vote no was that we would we would say we will not vote yes or no until there's a declaration of rights. That's defeated, and there's a final vote in June. The Virginians believed they were ninth. You can kind of see that again, that kind of pride of place. Hey, we'll be the one that brings the country together. It doesn't work out that way, obviously, because they're tenth, actually. When that happens, M Madison quickly sends a letter to Hamilton saying we voted. Now, again, New York was more anti-federalist than Virginia and probably had they voted early, would have voted against. Hamilton and others were able to stall that and kind of take a slow process. And basically, the moment he gets Madison's letter, he reads it out loud to New York saying, OK, look, it'll be us in Rhode Island and maybe North Carolina. Do you want to be out there alone? And so that is enough to convince you can see Melanchthon Smith. He was one of the key leaders of the anti-federalist group. And so that's enough to convince him, even if I don't like the new government, 
particularly because there's no rights listed, I think we should come in. So they ratify in, and so they're number 11. Now, we'll get back to North Carolina, Rhode Island in a minute. Now the question becomes, what happens? We've seen this data before. I showed you this on the very first slide, basically. There is one last attempt, by the way, of Rhode Island and North Carolina to try to stop the whole process because technically, even though there had been the 10 states or 11 states who had ratified, we still were under the government of the Articles Confederation. So they tried to defeat the new government in Congress and they fail. They get four votes against, but it, it still passes in the Congress because remember at the Articles Federation Congress, they voted by state, not by individual. So the states voted um, nine to four to go forward, basically to consider themselves out of government and we'll have a new government. They have a vote for president. George Washington is chosen and he receives, again, unanimously all the votes for the Electoral College. And meanwhile, Congress is supposed to start in March of 1789. Now, this takes us back to Monroe and very interesting. By the way, if you're interested in a, in a good book, this book here by Chris DeRose which is called uh, The Founding Rivals, Madison versus Monroe, is one I highly recommend to you. It, it's a really good walk through the Virginia story. Because what happens is, Ma is Adams is determined to punish Madison. So even though Madison probably could have easily been one of the first senators, Henry denies him that. And since two anti-federalists, two of his friends, up to, to what's well, New York, but up to Congress. Well, so then Henry's going to, I'm going to run for, House Representatives. Henry then convinces Monroe to run against Madison. James Monroe is the only president elected of the early elect who would have the opportunity for this, who actually opposed the Constitution. He eventually, as you know, gets swayed over by Jefferson, becomes a good Jeffersonian Republican, and is the president after Madison's two terms, um, in, uh, starting in um, 1816. So they're going to run for office. Meaning we come very close to a moment in which Madison might not be in the new government. Now, when the battle for his seat for House begins, Monroe is going to hammer on this part about the rights. And Madison knows he's really in trouble. They basically, um, Patrick Henry did a gerrymandering thing before gerrymandering was a thing. And he basically constructed a, a, a district for Madison's house that had Madison's uh, county. So he had to be in that county, but it also had more anti-federalists. So Madison was really going to have to work to convince his fellow Virginians to support him. It is in this campaign in early 1789 that we see Madison shift. So he makes this shift where he finally comes out. So he's putting in writing, which you can see one of his writings in his letters here, that you know what, Congress needs to make provisions to have a listing of the rights. We, we basically need to do what everybody's asking us for and construct some amendments to the constitution that will give us the rights. In the end, both because of him as the father of the constitution and his shift to support rights, you can see he wins fairly healthy. And again, I stress for you, the 1308 to 972 is quite significant because if you counted the votes for who'd voted for anti-federalist versus federalist going in from those counties, it's heavily anti-federalist, not two to one, but it's certainly 60-40. And so for Madison to have swung that many votes was very important in the process. So Madison goes off to Congress and to his credit, the very first day he's there, he says, I'm going to construct a list of amendments. And this gets us to the very famous Bill of Rights. We're almost swinging to the end. I just want to walk through a few of them and tie them back to the English Bill of Rights. And then, then I'm all yours. You want to ask some more questions. In the end, Madison lists, well, technically he lists seven, um, but he has roughly 16 different ideas. Remember, there were 124 ideas sent. There are many more that came in from other citizens. And many of these were uh, close together and some of them were far. So he had to kind of figure out a way to kind of build this into a coherent whole. He eventually will, and his list of 16 ideas will be made into 17 amendments by the House representatives. When the Senate gets this list, they will play around with it, alter it, tweak it, and eventually they'll come back with 12. Those 12 will be sent to the resolution committee that we know and have between the House and the Senate. And those 12 will be sent to us. 
Now, I find this very interesting when you look at these 12, because often when people talk about our Bill of Rights, they look at our first Bill of Rights and they perceive it as first in place. So the Bill of Rights that talks about our ability to have free speech protected. It's actually third. It wasn't Madison's first and it wasn't the country's first. Actually, the very first amendment was an amendment that wasn't passed. That was to try to make sure representation stayed close to the people. And basically, it was a system they were trying to devise about as the country grew, how many representatives. And we'll shift it from one rep for 30,000 to one rep for 50. If this was in practice today, House representatives would have roughly 7,000 members. So it's probably good that it wasn't chosen, but it does raise a key issue about their understanding of representation, which is not our topic. So I'll just leave it there. Second Amendment was about salary increases, that the government couldn't vote itself a salary increase or the salary increase couldn't take place until a new election. It also was not passed. But as you can see, in 1992, an enterprising college student found out about this. And these First Amendments, and there are other amendments to the Constitution where this has been the case, others where it's not been the case, had no statute of limitation. So technically, if we wanted to go and have a House of Representatives of 7,000 people, one rep for every 50,000, I think right now the current number on the First Amendment is 11 states have passed it, 12. So we need another 25 states or so to pass it, but it can be passed. Um, his professor gave this guy a C, but it turned out he was right. It was still viable. And in 1992, he gets it passed as the 27th Amendment. So that, of course, leads us to our number one. Number one to eight are really the only ones that deal with rights specifically. It's interesting. I like the first one. I like our First Amendment because, as you know, it starts off by saying Congress shall make no law. Had it been third, it wouldn't have had as much power in the process. But it, it's first because one and two didn't pass. And so the Third Amendment became our First Amendment. You can see in that amendment, I'm going to show these to you. I'm not going to stay on the slide long enough because hopefully you do know these. Or you can look them up and Google them really quickly. But the First Amendment reflects back to the English Bill of Rights in that question of freedom of speech. Can the king stop speech? Can the kingdom stop petition? The answer is no. So you see that reflected. It's also reflected in the act of toleration. Are we going to have freedom of religion in England? Yes, we are. Eventually, it's not in the Bill of Rights. It's in the act of toleration. And so you can see the, the citizens here doing it. When you read Madison's account, it's interesting for both what is our first and second. His, his idea about religion and his idea about the weaponry kind of reflects his viewpoint. There are differences from what actually kind of gets written. And in debates about particularly, nobody really argues that much about freedom of speech, but they certainly on the issue of religion and the establishment clause um, within the First Amendment, there's lots of questions there. Certainly, the Second Amendment has lots of debate, as you, I'm sure, are well aware of. Madison's um, ideas there are also instructive because it does seem like his writing the Second Amendment and the Third Amendment will do the same, as I'll show you in a second, connected much more towards the question of armies and, say, national security, um, as opposed to perhaps one's individual rights for some other purpose. But it is also important that you can see that it's for the security of a free country. When he says security of a free country, he's not only talking about external threats, say another nation attacking us, but again, the power of the government being too strong. Um, so, th so there's his view on those. This is, of course, what these are. There's one, two, and three for you. So one, notice with one, you'll see this in four, five, and six. I'm going to show you in a second. There's a lot of conflation, right? The First Amendment technically is covering like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things, right? So that's reflective of the fact that you had these multiplicity of ideas coming from the states and Congress was trying to write it out. Again, this is kind of my argument that we actually don't have a Bill of Rights. We just have a group of amendments that speak about some of the rights and they kind of dump them together. Some like one and four, five, and six are multifaceted. Some like two and three seem to be pretty specific and narrow. Um, two and three connect back to the English Bill of Rights. There's the statement in the Bill of Rights, for instance, that the subjects who are Protestants may have arms for their defense, um, that the raising and keeping of a standing army is against the law unless it's with the consent of Parliament. Now, in our list, four, five, six, seven, and eight all deal with law and judgment. 
So, of course, you all probably very famously know I plead the fifth, right? The Fifth Amendment. You can't make me testify against myself, which actually, as you'll see in a second, it's one of those conflated ones. All of those reflect back here to at least these three statements in the English Bill of Rights about excessive bail, about the idea of fines, and certainly back to Mayor Otis Warren's concern about are we not going to have jury trials anymore? Well, there should be a jury of our peers. So, of course, there's our four and five. They're huge. I will not stay here long. We will, we will definitely go late if we read these. But again, if you look at, say, number five, there's a lot of things listed there in number five, um, more than just whether or not I can be forced to testify against myself. So again, that kind of idea of conflating. I mean, again, people will say, we have a Bill of Rights, 10, 10, 10 Bill of Rights. It's actually multiple rights that are listed in there. If you listed them out singularly, there's five, uh, six, seven, and eight. Again, all of them connected to judges and juries and the judicial sense, which I think shouldn't surprise us in 1787, 88, because again, at this time period, the average experience for the average citizen who would be a peasant of peasant class um, at this time period was you have no rights. And certainly when you're in trouble, if you're not going to the court of the church, you're going to the court of the nobility or the king, and they're going to do what they want to do with you. You don't have a say so. So to make sure that it's clear that as average nobodies like I am, that I have a protection by the law from any external power being exerted against me was a big deal for them. So again, I think it's interesting. People think of our Bill of Rights and then they typically only know the first or second and they don't really know any of the rest of them. That's because they all deal with judging and stuff. And I think to a large degree, we kind of have blown that off. The last two are the weirdos. What do they even mean? We're not sure. The Supreme Court's not sure, quite honestly, particularly nine. Nine is not, it, it seems to be saying that the people still have rights, even if they're not enumerated. But this, so far in 200 plus years, the Supreme Court has basically not really ruled on the Ninth Amendment in any serious way or tied any kind of uh, court case through our years, as you know, our Supreme Court does, back to the Ninth Amendment, um, they kind of see it, at least what I've found, I'm not a Supreme Court expert, uh, you know, scholar, but, but they see it more as a structural statement about the current constitution rather than anything going into the future. However, it is, it is a kind of nice idea that's being reflected that there may be some rights we haven't thought of or that are not enumerated and, and we should have, we still have those. It kind of reflects to the idea that's really important from a Lockean point of view, that government never gives you rights. Your rights exist to you because you're a human and you're alive and you're breathing. Whatever your government may be, they don't give you rights. They should protect the rights, but the rights that I have. And then 10 is the really conflicting one and has a lot to do with what happens on our road to the Civil War, but also has a lot to do with other issues. We're in the middle of one of these debates right now with the issue of abortion. So. It says if it's not in the Constitution, then it's reserved for the states. But again, there's moments where that's been very questionable in the Supreme Court. And there's different times when you can see the Supreme Court kind of leaning into a state's rights position and the Supreme Court leaning back to a federal position. So, you know, make of that what you will. That's, again, not our focus to really dig into the Tenth Amendment, but I just wanted you to see it. And with that, they had satisfied most of the complaints. So they'd satisfied the complaints. So as you see here, North Carolina, North Carolina had voted against it, had been very opposed. But once the 12 amendments are passed, then a month and a half later, they have another convention. And while there still is opposition, it's easily two to one in favor of the Constitution. So North Carolina joins. Rhode Island, though, they're sticking to their guns. They are not going to do it. They're staying out and they will not be forced into it. They didn't go to the convention. They'll be happy to be their own nation in one sense. Hey, look, Luxembourg, Luxembourg can do it. So why can't we? And that was generally their position. However, there were Federalists in Rhode Island. And many of the Federalists were involved with banking and merchants. So they were seeing this is going to be bad for us if we have tried to run our own independent relationship. And to some degree, you could see the same questions that are being asked recently in the Brexit debate is something that you can see the Royal Islanders thinking. What would our relationship be with the larger organization to who we're closest to? Could we ever get trade agreements? They weren't certain. They were sticking to their guns, the anti-federalists. 
And then as you can see in 1790, so a good year and a half in, Congress passes a law that says, we're gonna take our own stand and they cut off trade. So they basically said, you will be a foreign entity and we'll talk about it later. Now, George Washington, as you're, if you were listening, right as we started, Beth was telling about a story of for her own sense of traveling and visiting a New England. Because George Washington, one of the things he had to do was really court the people to let them see him. There wasn't TV, obviously, to let them know that he was their president, not just for Virginia. And so there was a lot of efforts behind the scenes with Rhode Island. And as you can see, the very next day, once this happened, Rhode Islanders were in kind of not a convention, but kind of their their um, assembly was basically in discussions and there was debating and it was getting closer to passing. And finally, when word came that they'd been cut off, you can see the very next day, they voted 34, 32. And so they joined as the 13th state, uh, two years in to a year and a half really under Washington. And that brings us to the end. Um, what we find is this battle over rights will stick with us. There's, it's not going to go away. We still struggle over it today. Um, the unity that they thought they might have had will be impossible to hold. Joe Ellis's famous phrase there, the founding brothers, uh, they'll split and go their different ways. They'll form two political parties, basically over the question of how much power the government has because the fear of power and government is connected to my rights. What will government be able to do to me if it's got too much power? And that's still a question we wrestle with today, though obviously the setting has changed here in the 21st century and post 20th century with um, industrialism and urbanization and those kinds of things. However, Madison's system will last. Washington, as you know, will be elected for the first two terms. Then we'll have our first next president in the 1796 election, which John Adams will win. And there's a peaceful turnover by the time of the 1800 election. There's two active parties. John Adams is not in one of those, but the two active parties will have a very raucous battle with each other and the Republicans will win. Jefferson will take over, as you know, in 1800, and there's a peaceful transition. And every time up until 1860s election in the 61 inauguration, 1861, um, it holds. And because of that battle, as you know how that goes down, it still holds. We still have it today. So even though there was a battle about ratification and a battle about rights, and we haven't quit asking these questions about rights, as we still always are wrestling between the issues of Locke and Hobbes and really Rousseau, Montesquieu to some degree, we still hold our system, and our system has been successful to this point. And I'll stop right there. Beth, thank you so much for letting me come and speak with you guys. And I am open for any questions that you might want to ask. And I'll turn it back over to Beth. And I think I'll stop. I'll, I'll leave my information up here in case you want it for a little bit. Then I'll stop sharing so you can see each other if you want to. So, Beth, it's all yours. Oh, OK. It's all mine. Um, I can't see everybody's. Maybe Janet, either one of you, whoever wants or somebody can just pop in whatever's best for you. Yeah, guys. I think I think that would be best, Janet. How, are, how do you want to do the questions? Oh, you're muted, sweetie. Carl, do you want to stop sharing so we can see everybody? I, I happily will do that. Okay. And then if anybody wants to unmute and ask um, questions, Carl is open. The floor is open. Any thoughts, questions? Carl, it was unbelievably, I tell you, you get me so excited about history. Thank you. <laughs> That's right, right. Thank you. Carl, I have a question. As, as a Massachusettsian, um, Otis Warren um, not wanting to, being an anti-federalist, how much did that have to do with the strength of the Massachusetts Constitution? And in fact, all the, all the other states, were they comparing the federal constitution with their individual state constitutions thinking ours ours has the rights listed um yeah that's a good question i i think to some degree yes i would say it differently and the way i would say it differently is you have to remind yourself where we had just come our entire battle for the revolution was to extricate ourselves from what we stated was a tyrannical or oppressive, over aggressive government. So from their minds in the anti-federalist camp, 
the ideas of Madison, and to some degree by his own comments, was to set up that type of government. A mm-hmm. government that could be oppressive, could be everywhere, and could kind of dictate um, things. I mean, Hamilton said it, a good government is one that is energetic, it's constant, it's active. And at least when he's writing the Constitution, Madison's in the same camp. So for people like Patrick Henry, for Thomas Paine, that is that it's a betrayal of everything we fought for. And so okay. to go down that road is particularly a decade later, right? You're not even a decade out. We signed the, the Treaty of Paris in 83, and here four years later, that, that's why I say many of them, had they been in conversation with Madison, would have said, give it a minute. It's only been like four years. Let's wait and see if it's as bad as you think it is. There was evidence that it was not going to be effective. But they always, my students will sometimes come from websites in their preparation. They'll say, oh, yeah, I know what happened. The articles was a bad government. I'm like, no, that's not the way. The articles were an intentional government. And it did precisely what they intended. So then the concern by the anti-federalist path was to say, we don't want to, we don't want to drop that. And so then they thought, uh-huh. because for them, government was local. So then they could look at their state constitutions and say, we like what we're doing here. And in many cases, not all, but in many of the 13, we have a very clear listing of rights and we feel safest and protected here with the ideas that we think are best for society. And hey, what you guys do in Virginia, that's on you. You go do your thing. We don't have to worry about it. We're going to do our thing and we're happy with it. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, Carl, thank you just so kindly for giving of your time. And like I said, it's just, you just re-energize me about history, which is one of my favorite subjects. So thank you everybody for giving up your time this evening. And we just really appreciate Dolores has you a helping question. us out. Oh, hold on, yeah, Dolores, you're on mute. Go ahead. You're on mute, there you go. Carl, would you repeat the book that you recommended? I would. I actually want to show you two. There's several, but the, the two, the one I, so this is Chris DeRose. I'm trying to make sure the lights, let me see if I can get the light so it's not so blurry. And there's Madison and there's Monroe. And the title of it is Founding Rivals. Chris DeRose, D-E, small e, capital R-O-S-E. Thank you. Uh-huh. And then Joe Ellis, who again is one of my favorites, he wrote a book called The Quartet, and he's talking about this, how we got to our Constitution. The Bill of Rights is only a portion of his work, but it's it's a really good reading. It, it, Joe's writing is so good, um, and it flows really well. If you've not read Founding Brothers, you should read Founding Brothers. Um, but this so this is called The Quartet, and the focus is on, um, uh, on, on Madison, Hamilton, um, uh, Washington, and John Jay and their efforts to try to get through uh, get through the, the process. So I recommend both those books. They're really good. There's, there's actually not a lot of writings about um, like what went on in the Constitution convention, um, primarily because the recording, the record keeping was, was kind of scattered. You kind of have to put it together. Uh, so there's some older books that are also good. Um, the Miracle of Philadelphia is one, it's written in the 70s. And I don't remember the author right now, but those are those are two good ones. The, the battle between Madison and Monroe is just in, in interesting because, as you probably know, both Madison and Monroe, my way of saying it, become, you know, the boys of Jefferson. You know, Jefferson's yes. their hero. And so, you know, to know, you, you sort of just think, well, obviously, Madison, Monroe and Jefferson were always on the same page. And you find out actually they weren't. Madison would have been. I mean, I just told you he'd be close friends with Hamilton. They're writing letters. He's 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 very supportive of the Constitution, and he's disappointed that Jefferson opposes. Within a year of Jefferson coming back, Madison is a little sycophant. But Monroe ran for office against um, Madison as an anti-federalist, and so that's interesting also. So it's just a fascinating read about Virginia politics and what was happening in Virginia at that time. Thank you. You're so welcome. And if you have any questions later that come up, Beth and Janet both have a way to get to me. If you didn't get my email, yep. I'm with the college, but they've got another email. So you can get to them and say, hey, can you get this question to that guy? And I promise I'll email you back. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs>
Thank you, Carl, so much. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate Have a good it. Good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.